I've always avoided shooting on real film based on the assumption that it's too expensive. But recently I've discovered it doesn't have to actually cost that much. This is the Krasnogorsk 3, a Russian camera from the 80s that was designed to shoot 16mm film, but has been modified to cover the wider Super 16 format. I bought it on eBay for £137. These cameras are pretty common, you just have to make sure they're in good working condition and that they have been modified with a recentered lens. Now the K3 does have some pretty major quirks, some would say flaws, but we'll get to that. First, let's talk about Super 16 in general. Once you have a camera, you'll need film. So Kodak sent us some 100 foot rolls of their Vision 3 stock. Each one gives you about two and a half minutes of recording time, and that's where the real costs come in. We had two rolls of 50D and one roll of 200T, and to be honest, neither of them were particularly grainy. So next time I'll definitely go for the 250D so that we can still shoot in daylight, but we won't need quite as much artificial light. When it comes to shooting, the main thing with film is that you can't trust what you see through the viewfinder. So to avoid footage that's too bright or too dark, it's best to use a light meter to take a reading in front of what we're filming and then set the aperture on the lens to match. If it reads anything lower than what the lens can handle, then we should probably add more light or just film somewhere brighter or else the footage will be underexposed. Now it has to be said that light meters are stupidly expensive, so it's definitely worth looking into the much cheaper but also less reliable options like using an app on your smartphone or bringing a digital camera with the same settings and using that to choose the right aperture. But if there's one thing you remember, it should be that it's better to overexpose negative film than to underexpose. So if in doubt, open up the lens or add more light. Next is focusing. Again, we can't trust the viewfinder, so we need to measure the distance between the camera and what we're filming, and then use the lens markings to set that distance. If we need to change the focus during the shot, then we'll practice all the movement, take two measurements, and then put marks down on the floor for the actors, and then have the focus change between those two distances. This is where it's really worth working with a camera assistant, and Natalie did an excellent job for our shoot, nailing the focus every time. The next thing to remember is that if any stray light leaks into the camera, then it will ruin the undeveloped film. That's why we had tape all over the camera and why we put the lens cap back on as soon as we were finished filming or looking through the viewfinder. We only took it off when we needed to. Now speaking of which, it's best to cover that between takes too. And a toothpaste cap works pretty well with the K3. Now when we're shooting on film, it's absolutely crucial that we know how much film we have left. So on the K3, that means lifting up some of the tape to check the footage counter. 30 means full, 15 is half full, etc, etc. Now that little counter has a big impact on the shoot because once we're out of film, either we're done or we need to go and spend the money on more film and another shoot day. So you end up thinking really carefully before shooting anything and doing rehearsals with a digital camera. I think it actually gives a sense of importance to every shot, where digital can sometimes feel a little bit disposable. But really the costs come down to your shooting ratio. So at a push you could probably make a 15 minute short film with 40 minutes of film, but the more you plan out the shoot and rehearse, the more money you can save. But even so, I'm obviously not going to be shooting on film for every project, but I can totally imagine using it for a music video or for a commercial that doesn't have too much dialogue or even another short film. Now when it comes to audio, we need to match up our sound with the silent film using a slate or a clap on set. And that is where we encounter the K3's first major quirk. Have a listen to this. Live short, be chill and be kind. The mic is close to the talent and the camera is about eight feet away. And yet the sound of the motor is pretty hard to ignore. This is standard for wind up 16mm cameras. They just make a lot of noise. So we ended up recording sound while rehearsing for each shot and then would just match up each sound with the film in post. But obviously that doesn't really work with long bits of dialogue. So this is a lot more suited for more visually centered projects. For dialogue heavy projects, that's where renting one of the more expensive, quieter cameras does make a lot of sense. Another quirk of the K3 is that you have to wind it up between every take, and that gives you about 25 seconds of shooting before it needs winding again. So we're probably not going to be shooting very many documentaries with this camera, but for narrative films, 25 seconds is usually fine. 
And the last thing is that when you look through the viewfinder, it looks a bit like this, but because of the widescreen modification, what we're filming ends up like this. What this means is that we need to imagine that extra 20% of screen space on the right, so the center point is actually 10% to the left. Now that does take a bit of getting used to, but I actually found it wasn't as difficult as I thought it would be after a bit of practice. Now the one thing we haven't covered so far is how to load the film into the camera, and that's different for every camera, but the basic priorities are to minimize the amount of light that hits the unexposed film, and to make sure there's absolutely no dust inside the camera. Now we obviously weren't diligent enough, because some of the footage towards the end of the day does have a fair amount of dust buildup. I'm clearly no expert, so I'll leave a link in the description to some videos for how to load the K3. Once we're done with the shoot, the film needs to be processed and digitized. And basically you just package it up and send it off in the post along with a hard drive. And it comes back as one long digital file, which we can then chop up into individual shots and then start editing like any other footage. Most of our footage was underexposed. We didn't really have enough light for that low sensitivity film stock, but I was able to bring up the exposure without the footage looking too grainy. In general, I also shifted the colors towards green because there was a fairly strong magenta tint, but with those small corrections, the footage looked great. Finally, I looked at the audio test and ended up slowing down all of the footage to about 95% because evidently the wind-up mechanism isn't perfectly accurate or maybe we just didn't have the frame rate setting exactly on 24. So it may seem like I've spent this whole video talking about the drawbacks of shooting on film and especially the K3 with its loud wind-up motor and off-center viewfinder. But of course there are plenty of benefits to shooting on film too. It looks so organic. I really like the color and the grain and the flicker. On the whole, the process just feels more tactile and special. Because you know, as we head towards these modern cameras with flawless autofocus and sensors that can basically see in the dark and gimbal stabilizers so that no matter what you do with your hands, the footage will still stay stable. All of these features are a real great luxury to have, but I do wonder whether it's gonna make us lazy. There really is something special about measuring your focus and exposure by hand and making sure you don't use too much film. It gives everything a sort of intentionality that's really hard to replicate with the conveniences of digital. So whether you try the K3 or rent a less quirky camera, I'd highly recommend trying out shooting on film. And if you do, there's a bunch of links in the description that are going to be really helpful. I learned a lot from Christian and his work on the True Film YouTube channel, but also linked in the description is the little short film that we made if you're curious about what's possible in one day with 300 feet of film. My name's Simon Cade, this has been DSLR Guide and I'll see you.